Welcome, everyone. Can you hear me all right? Okay. If my voice drops too much and you can't hear me, just please yell out and I'll try to raise my voice. So is there anyone here tonight who's here for the first time? Oh, welcome. Oh, welcome. Wonderful. So nice to see new people and older people, too. So welcome. There's no experience necessary. We're all beginners. So I'll I'll try to keep the the jargon to a minimum. Actually, I don't have much jargon. So, but if there's anything that I say you don't understand, please just ask. And uh, I like to start by having people turn to someone next to them if they're comfortable with that, and just saying hello, maybe saying what your name is and greeting the other person. So, if you could take a moment to do that. The way we usually do this is to spend about half an hour in practice, by which I mean, for those who are new, uh, some form of sitting meditation. So I'll guide it a little bit, but then uh, there'll be some silence as well. And then we'll, we might do a little stretching because we will have been sitting for a while. Then I have a few remarks, blessedly few, uh, to offer. And... Then I've got another practice that I would like us to do um, and some opportunity for uh, discussion if there is any. So that's the plan. Is there anything that I, anybody would like that I've not included? Okay, you're always uh, welcome to speak up if there is. And I want to acknowledge that uh, there's a lot going on within this community. Those who are new probably aren't aware, but our guiding teacher is ill. And uh, so I think we're, we may be holding a lot uh, in the room. So actually what I'm going to talk about is related to that. And hi, Pietro. <laughs> so, all right. So let's settle in and find a comfortable posture, whatever that might be for you. You're always welcome to lie down if sitting is not your thing tonight. So just finding whatever works for your body. And I'll start with the sound of the bell. So beginning by drawing your attention to the felt sense of the body. Feeling the weight of the body sitting. Feeling the contact with whatever you're sitting on. Feeling the support of the earth underneath. The earth element in the body, solidity, weight. The earth element in the body resting on the earth below. Earth touching earth. So as best you are able, resting down, inviting the body to relax, to be held. And within the stillness, the relative stillness of the body, feeling the movement of the breath.
the breath coming into the body and the breath leaving the body. The wind element Feeling the wind inside the body and the wind outside the body. And feeling temperature in the body heat, cold, this is what's called the fire element in the body. Aware of the fire element inside the body and the temperature outside the body. And noticing any feeling of liquidity or a sense of cohesion in the body, the water element. Aware of the water element inside the body and the water element outside. The moisture in the air. Water inside and outside. And finally, aware of space. Our bodies are made up mostly of space. Noticing any sense of space or spaciousness in the body. And aware of the space that surrounds the body. Space inside and space outside. So allowing the mind to rest now on whatever object is most appropriate for you tonight, whether that be the felt sense of the body or the breath in the body, or if it appeals to you, noticing the elements Or maybe just a wider awareness of whatever is arising in the moment. So depending on your state of mind tonight, finding what is most appropriate for you, and inviting the mind and body to rest.
And whenever the mind wanders off as the mind will, gently inviting it to return to this moment, to this place, to this body and this breath. And if at any moment you encounter any resistance to what you are experiencing, then meeting that with a kind awareness. And as much as possible, just coming back to the felt sense of the moment and the body and the breath. This is how it is now. May I meet it with an open heart and an open mind. Coming back over and over again to just this moment.
meeting each moment with a kind attention.
So now gently bringing your attention once again to the felt sense of spaciousness in the body as best you are able. Seeing if you can feel into the space within the body. and expanding out your awareness to include the space around the body, the space in the room, maybe even a connection to the space, the virtual space that connects the people on Zoom here tonight. Just feeling into this space and these other beings that are sitting in the room or who are occupying the virtual space. Perhaps feeling some gratitude for the fact that we're not doing this alone, that there are other people who have showed up tonight, people who are interested in practicing and exploring the teachings. It makes it so much easier We're not alone. So feeling into that space and the felt sense of these other beings. And perhaps sensing or sending out just a few words or the energy of gratitude. Thank you. Thank you for being here. And thanking yourself also for making the effort to be here, to join with others. Breathing in and breathing out. If you want to take a minute to stand up or stretch or do whatever you need to do. I realized I didn't introduce myself earlier. (laughs) I suppose you know who I am. Anyways, my name's Jean, and I want to introduce Ryan, who is my faithful assistant. (laughs) I feel so uh, happy to have Ryan here handling all this stuff. (laughs) so that I don't have to do it. So thank you. And Eric, where's Eric? Anyways, thank you. And thanks again for coming. So um, I'll just offer a few words and then I have another practice I'd like us to do and hopefully some opportunity for sharing. So I I really struggled with what um, I might say tonight, uh, given uh, the situation with uh, Mark Lundberg. If you don't know who he is, he's the guiding teacher here, and he uh, apparently is has a serious illness. And I think many of us found that um, sh- uh, the word that comes to my mind is shocking. You know, we kind of kind of expect that things will remain the same or something, and they never do. So um, for me anyways, uh, the news of his illness was um, quite unsettling. Maybe it was for you too. So um, what I had thought I was going to talk about, which was something about possibility, I like I like to talk about possibility. Um, I I felt like that was a little too remote or too heady or something um, from what at least some of the people in this room might be experiencing. So um, I wanted to make space for that. And uh, so 
whenever I'm feeling um, unsettled, I guess is the right word, uh, or challenged by something in my life, I like to turn to Pema Chodron. I don't know if you know Pema Chodron. She's a, an American Tibetan nun um, who has been practicing for a long, long time, has written many books. And I find her teachings to be very accessible and um, inspiring, really. So uh, she's written books with wonderful titles like The Wisdom of No Escape. Um, she wrote a book called When Things Fall Apart. They all seemed very relevant. So I, I looked at uh, When Things Fall Apart, which was published in, I think, 2000, uh, 23 years ago. And um, I looked at the introduction, and, and so this is what she said. She talks about what she realized about what she teaches. I began to see that in some way, no matter what subject I had chosen, what country I was in, or what year it was, I had taught endlessly about the same things. The great need for, um, I suppose it's pronounced Maitri, I think it's Maitri, so that's a Tibetan word, but it, it's, it means loving kindness for ourselves. The great need for loving kindness for oneself and developing from that the awakening of a fearlessly compassionate attitude toward our own pain and that of others. It seemed to me that the view behind every single talk was that we could stop, step into uncharted territory and relax with the groundlessness of our situation. The other underlying theme was dissolving the dualistic tension between us and them, this and that, good and bad, by inviting in what we usually avoid. My teacher called it, quote, leaning into the sharp points, end quote. Leaning into the sharp points. So they say there's, a, there's just one Dharma talk that's repeated just over and over again by everyone. I've heard different explanations for what that is, but this was her description of what she thinks she's teaching. So I thought tonight, um, drawing on her inspiration, we could spend some time leaning into the sharp points and offering ourselves and others compassion and relaxing as best we can into the groundlessness of the situation. That's the piece that's the most unsettling to me. Just the idea of groundlessness just kind of freaks me out. <laughs> so I don't know what your reaction is, but when we get right down to it, it's true, right? None of us expected Mark to be sick, and now he is. So um, I think it's worth exploring. So this feels like a big agenda. We'll see. We'll see where it goes. So leaning into the sharp points, inviting what we usually avoid. In my experience, this is a lifelong practice. Um, I, I'm someone who likes to fix things. I don't know if you're fixers, but I'd rather fix something. Like as soon as I heard Mark was sick, I had I got on Google and tried to decide what he had. You know, so I I need I have this need to control or fix. I think that's a human tendency. I'd much rather do that or distract myself looking on Google than to feel afraid or sad about whatever is there. And you might take a moment and just reflect on what kind of what your go-to is. Maybe it's just being present with what is, but that's that's a pretty advanced practice. And I think the the facing what's really happening requires a level of both honesty and vulnerability that can be both scary and but it's also liberating when we're able to do it. And I can't say that I'm very good at it myself, but I, I've learned a lot from my teachers about this. So I wanted to talk about one of my first teachers. And this is someone that I knew 
long before I knew anything about Buddhism. And he is a man named um, Daniel Gottlieb. And uh, Dan, or Dr. Gottlieb, was, and he still is, a psychologist. And he, he used to have a call-in um, radio show on public radio in Philadelphia, where I lived for many years before I moved here. And um, the name of the program was something like Family Matters. So he was a psychologist, and people would call in with their family issues. And he would talk to them about what was going on. And he he didn't so much offer advice. He just held the space for whatever was there. And he allowed them to find their answers. And in 1979, when I was living in Philadelphia, he was uh, driving on the Pennsylvania Turnpike. And uh, a tractor trailer uh, that was coming towards him, lost a tire, and the tire went over his car and squ squashed the top of his car down on his head. And in the space of a moment, he was a quadriplegic. And uh, I, I kind of, I didn't participate in it, but I was a witness to that because I, I heard about this and then I saw what happened following that. And he eventually went back to his radio program. He just he just actually retired from that recently. So he's lived as a quadriplegic since 1979, which is quite astounding. But um, there's a description of the early hours after his accident, which is um, recounted in this wonderful little book, I like books, called The Resilient Spirit. And it's by um, Polly Young Eisendrath, who's a Jungian analyst, but she's, a, she's also a Buddhist practitioner. And um, she, this is his description of what happened after that accident, Dr. Gottlieb's description. It took us around three hours to get to Philadelphia in the ambulance. And when we arrived, I looked up at the people in the emergency room and said, Help me or kill me, either is okay. I was very, very verbal about my pain and my psychic injury, but no one would listen. The one young medical resident walking by the room at about midnight looked in and saw me and then returned. He just looked for a minute or so and then said, I have no idea what you're going through. But my wife and I just went through a miscarriage. And if your pain is anything like mine, it must be just awful. I never forgot him. Dr. Young Eisendrath, the author of this book, goes on to say, <clears throat> in this brief interchange, Dan experienced the gift of a stranger's compassion. In directly acknowledging his pain, the resident had reached Dan at the level of some recognizable truth. And for the first time after the accident, Dan was open to another person. So this, this resident, this young resident, started this interaction with Dan by naming his own pain. Not to shift the focus to himself or make it be all about himself, but to begin to build a bridge with the other. It was not an either or situation, but it was a both and. And I, th I think it's a really beautiful example of what Pema Chodron talked about, this fear fearlessly compassionate attitude toward our own pain and that of others. Fearlessly compassionate attitude toward our own pain, so not forgetting our own pain and that of others. So Joseph Goldstein, who is a teacher in this tradition, says, compassion isn't self-pity or pity for others. It's really feeling one's own pain and recognizing the pain of others. Seeing the web of suffering we're all entangled in, we become kind and compassionate to one another. So... Um, 
one of the things that I do here is to is to teach with Jane Roundhorse a, a class on mindful self-compassion. Some of you have taken it, some of you are in it now. And I've learned a lot from teaching that class. And um, one of the things that I've learned is that a lot of us are very reluctant to turn towards and acknowledge our own suffering because we think it's insignificant in the face of what others are experiencing. So we feel perfectly okay being compassionate towards others, but somehow we exclude ourselves. We think that our suffering is different or we're not worthy or whatever we think, which of course comes from our conditioning as children. And some of us may have even created a sense of identity around our suffering. I know some people like this. So this is my story and this is my experience and no one else suffers in this way. And, and when we do that, we make it very fixed and unchanging. This is mine and I'm not going to share it with anybody else. And both of those scenarios of feeling either unworthy of our own compassion or feeling that our suffering is somehow different from others can lead us to feeling very isolated and alone. And I know, I know some people like this. It's very difficult to see because we're less able to fully connect to the fact that we're all in this boat together. So being aware of our, of our own suffering and noticing our relationship to it, whether we're aversive to it or whether we can embrace it. And then being able to offer ourselves compassion, either for the fact that we're aversive or just for the fact that we're suffering is really fundamental to our ability to be with others suffering. Just as that young resident in that emergency room in Philadelphia almost 50 years ago, he was able to le level the playing field by naming his own suffering, by owning his own suffering first. And that was in a way a gift that he offered to Dr. Gottlieb, a bridge to their shared humanity. So this is, a, this is another quote from Pema Chodron. Compassion is not a relationship between the healer and the wounded. It's a relationship between equals. Only when we know our own darkness well can we be present with the darkness of others. To the degree that we look clearly and compassionately at ourselves, we feel confident and fearless about looking into someone else's eyes. Compassion becomes real when we recognize our shared humanity. So I, tonight I thought we could spend some time uh, feeling our own suffering, if you will. It sounds like a big task, but uh, getting uh, perhaps a little closer to it and offering ourselves some compassion so that we're better able to be with the, the suffering of others, including those in our, in our own community. We are no less and no different from anyone else. So before I go there, I wanted to see if there were any comments, reactions, questions, or anything else to anything I've said so far. Does this idea make sense to you? Do you not agree with it? What's your experience of meeting your own suffering as a bridge to others? Yeah, and I've noticed that if I give kindness to parts of myself that are really unappealing, like the abuser in me, the bully in me, the thug in me, like the parts of myself that I like to say are out there, I actually get liberated really fast. Huh. I find it very freeing. Huh. It's a, it's, it's a, yeah. Yeah. And what it what does that feel like to be liberated? If I can ask, how do you how it do you know like that? A part of me that's been underneath that oppression, that internalized oppression, 
flies up above it and and just passes beyond it. Uh, it's like an uh, obstacle that if I take the obstacle inside, I don't have to try to change the world. I just have to identify it and label it and then move. It, it's literally a feeling of moving uh, up and past. Uh, beautiful. Thank you. Anyone else? Yeah, thank you. Yeah, so how to be with your own and also not, not make the others bigger than yours or, or notice that anyways. Yeah, yeah, thank you. There was something else you said that I was going to comment on, but I've forgotten what it was, but thank you. Yeah, anyone else? Yeah. I feel like it's such a intimate and vulnerable dance of just that self suffering of self and others and how interwoven it is and it just my my livelihood and my own personal journey it's been like many years of like exploring that in deep ways rather than crisis work and trauma work with others and I'm really kind of exploring like what is the role of like wise boundaries and who are the people that I choose in my life? The, the tension between like, am I controlling? Like, oh, if you can't be with my suffering, then I don't have time for you because I, I'm holding all this space for everybody else, you know? Uh -huh. Or, but also being like, yeah, I don't have unlimited, you know? I, it's like uh -huh. this, it's, yeah, tenderness. Uh, there's levels to it, right? There's wide speech and the presence and the emotional awareness. And, you know, and so it's like, oh, I need, you know, noticing that I, I don't just need like, oh, that must be hard. I need like, oh, you know, like I need the intimacy. And so uh -huh. so uh -huh. holding all of that is like, feels like part of my practice yeah. as well. Yeah, thank you. You use the word intimacy and you use the word relationship. So this, yeah, how are we relating moment to moment? And it's different every moment. Yeah. Thank you. Anyone else? So I thought we would do a practice of your game. Um, those who have been in the in the mindful self-compassion class will recognize this. Um, but it's a practice that um is about connecting with our own suffering and then um, a more somatic way, I guess, of offering ourselves compassion and then offering it out to others. So, um, yeah, so I would just invite you to, if you choose to, to try it out and uh, if it's not to your liking or it gets to be too much or anything else, you can always put your attention elsewhere or just ignore what I'm saying or whatever you'd like to do. But uh, if you want to try it out, then I'll be happy to lead you in the practice. So it's it's um, it's a it's a it's a combination of a practice that's called um, the self compassion moment something like that. I forgot what it's called. And then uh, giving and receiving compassion. So um, yeah, it's, uh, it's one that I've adapted from others, which I've have found helpful in my own process. So I just invite you then to find a, a comfortable posture again. If you want to lie down, you're welcome to lie down or just stay seated. And I forgot to ask Ryan, who's now laid down, if there was anybody on, on Zoom who wanted to say anything. I forgot to ask. Sorry, Zoomers. Anything in the chat? No? Okay. All right. Thank you. Okay. You may lie down again. <laughs> okay. All right, so I'm finding a comfortable posture again.
allowing your eyes to close if that feels right or keeping them partially open. Feeling the weight of the body. Feeling the contact with whatever you're resting on. Feeling the support of the earth. the earth element in the body, touching the earth element beneath. And feeling the breath in the body. The movement of the breath as it comes into the body and as it leaves the body. Feeling the wind element in the body. And now when you're ready, letting the full felt sense of the body and the breath recede into the background of your awareness and bringing into the foreground the memory of a situation in your life that is causing you some suffering, some difficulty. Could be a relationship issue or physical ailment anything really, choosing something that seems manageable tonight, so not the biggest challenge in your life, but also something that's not too small, something that has some charge to it. So not worrying about getting the absolute right thing, but just calling to mind, seeing what arises when you reflect on a difficulty or some suffering in your life. And when you have a situation in mind, allowing yourself to feel into that situation Noticing in as much detail as possible, any people who might be involved, place, any other aspects of the situation. Living into that experience of suffering as though it were here right now. And being mindful of all of the discomfort that this situation causes right now, any sensations in the body, agitation in the mind, strong emotions, feeling into and acknowledging the suffering not turning away. Perhaps even silently saying to yourself, this is a moment of suffering, or this is how I feel right now. This is a moment of suffering. So validating the discomfort for yourself.
could be as simple as this is hard. Ouch. Using whatever words validate how you feel. And as you feel into and acknowledge this suffering, this difficulty, reminding yourself that this is a part of what makes us human. Suffering is a part of life. Everyone suffers. It spares no one. It is especially evident at this moment in history and also in this community of practitioners. We all suffer. This is what it means to be human. I am not alone. And if you choose, you could offer yourself other forms of comfort. You could place a hand or hands over your heart or elsewhere on your body that feels soothing. Finding ways to offer yourself compassion for the fact of your suffering for that part of your humanity. Not as a way to fix it or make it go away, but just because it hurts. Offering yourself compassion. And as you do so, reflecting on if there are words that might capture this benevolent, this compassionate attitude towards your own experience. Words stated perhaps as an aspiration. Something like, may I eat myself with kindness or may I find peace. Whatever it is that might be of comfort to you. Finding the words that speak to you and your suffering. An aspiration for your well-being. And if you choose, you could match it to the breath. So on the in-breath, just breathing in that aspiration, either as form of may I, or maybe just a word, peace, love, whatever it is you're most needing. Breathing it in on the inhalation. And then gently breathing out. Practicing opening your heart to yourself. You too are worthy of compassion. Breathing in for yourself and then gently exhaling. And now becoming aware once again of the others here tonight. Sensing into the presence of other beings in this room and also on Zoom. All of us together in a practice community. And if you choose, you could breathe in that wish for your own well-being, that wish for compassion and breathe out something similar to those in the room and on Zoom. 
So if you're wishing yourself peace, breathing in peace, and breathing out to the others here tonight, the same wish, peace, or whatever it is that's come to your mind tonight. Breathing in for yourself and breathing out to the others in the room tonight and on Zoom. Building that bridge between your own experience and the experience of everyone here tonight. Breathing in for yourself and breathing out for the others. And if there are others that you would like to include tonight, others who are not here, either on Zoom or in person, others in this practice community, the guiding teacher, Mark, Mark's family, or others that are not known to this group, friends, family members, even those that are not known to us personally, so many people in this world suffering, all of us, in fact. So breathing in compassion for yourself and sending out on the out breath, breath compassion for others. Breathing in for yourself and breathing out for others. Practicing compassion not to fix anything or even to make it different, but just because it is, this is the human situation. Breathing in for yourself and breathing out for others. So that's one practice that I can offer that I think helps build up this muscle of offering ourselves some kindness and compassion and then bridging it out to others. I noticed that I was rocking when I was doing that because <laughs> it, it uh, yeah, for me, it's just such a soothing thing to do. So I'm curious about people's experience of that. Did that resonate with anybody? Did you find it helpful? Did you fall asleep? <laughs> Anything is okay. Um, yeah, I... Um, like this last year, there's been... Um, I've had a couple of relationships, family relationships turned south on me and um i got into the squabble with my uh, younger brother um and um like i'm the oldest of a large family that's undergone a lot of difficulties and it's always been my role has to be kind of like the fixer and um and so my younger brother got himself into a squabble with me. Um, and I just decided I couldn't fix it this time. That in spite of everything I've done, all the advice I'd given him. So I told him you're going to have to live with this one. And he was just mad as hell about it. And um, but it got to the point where... Um, 
you know, it's, you know, this, this was broken and there was nothing I could do to fix it. And, um, and so he said, he's going to hate me as long as he lives. And he may be true about that. I don't know. Um, but like when I came to the end of it, you know, what can I do? And there was nothing, there was nothing I can do to fix this. Um, that's kind of when the self-compassion, you know, I was trying to feel some compassion toward my brother, but I just saw it was to me that needed the compassion. And, um, yeah, that's enough. So this is from Claire. It was difficult for me to feel self-compassion until I imagined someone I love, um, for example, my son suffering similarly. At that point, I could find the words that also really comforted me. Mm. Mm. Anyone else? How was it to offer yourself compassion? How was it to offer yourself compassion? Everyone's looking at the floor. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I I don't know if I was in like a trance or what, but it was, I just wasn't in my head with mm -hmm. it. It doesn't have to be so like mm -hmm. logical, mm -hmm. but just, I think I could, I could feel it. Mm -hmm. and, um, and that feels good. Mm -hmm. But letting that energy kind of mm -hmm. that circulate. Mm -hmm. uh, other, other. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's what I, I like about the the breathing part of it. It does bring you out of your head. Yeah. You have to try so hard in a way. At least I, I don't have to try so hard. Yeah. Thank you. And this reminds me of a song, um, doing the best I can with what I got. Doing the best I can with what I got. Got it. Yeah, thank you. I'd love to ask you to sing it, but I won't. <laughs> I said I'd love to ask you to sing it, but I won't. <laughs> All right. Well, maybe I'll... Uh... I'll end with a poem and we can dedicate the merit and I think we'll call it a wrap. So this is a poem by uh, Michael Le Lunig, I guess is how he pronounces his name from a book called The Traveling Lunig. When the heart is cut or cracked or broken, do not clutch it. Let the wound lie open. Let the wind from the good old sea blow in to bathe the wound with salt and let it sting. Let a stray dog lick it. Let a bird lean in the hole and sing a simple song like a tiny bell and let it ring. I'll read it again. When the heart is cut or cracked or broken, do not clutch it. Let the wound lie open. Let the wind from the good old sea blow in to bathe the wound with salt and let it sting. Like a, let a stray dog lick it. Let a bird lean in the hole and sing a simple song like a tiny bell and let it ring. So one of the ways we, we end our practice together is something called dedicating the merit or sharing the merit. And it's so just a recognition of the fact that our practice is not only for our own well-being, but for the well-being of others. 
So I'd like to do that together. And then Eric, wherever he is, uh, will have a few words to say too. So I just invite you again to find a comfortable posture. If you feel comfortable with putting your hands together, it's just a form of, um, hmm, I was going to say devotion. I guess that's how I think of it. Just a kind of acknowledging the sacredness of the practice. So taking a moment to, again, connect to the felt sense of the body, these human bodies sitting and breathing, these human hearts beating. And reflecting on the fact that um, it took some effort to come here tonight. This was not a simple thing to do, to log on to our computer or to drive our cars or take the bus or wherever we got here, that there was some effort involved. And what used to be called some merit, some goodness, in our coming together, in our intentions. So recognizing that and dedicating whatever goodness might arise from our practice together, from our intention to cultivate compassion. And we're going to dedicate that to the well being of all beings everywhere. Beings big and small being seen and unseen, born and yet to be born, beings with legs and wings and fins, beings all over this planet and to the planet itself, dedicating whatever goodness may arise from our practice and from our good intentions to the well-being of all of these beings. May all beings everywhere be free from suffering. May all beings everywhere know peace. Thank you for coming. And Eric had a few words to say. I'm sorry. Just put it. I will. Okay. I put it in soon. So. Hey. Mm -hmm. Um. Just a quick note that uh, Common Ground offers all the program in the free spirit of uh, generosity. If you'd like to volunteer or support the center. You could go online. I put for people on Zoom. I put the link in the chat. But you could go. Uh, there's a section on the website that says supporting the center. Um, if you donate, please uh, financially, uh, please put Jean Haley in the the teacher fund box. The two thirds of all the the gifts go to supporting the teachers' livelihood, and one third goes to uh, supporting the like the the physical location, the, um, the running of the center and our, our paid teacher staff. So um, there's also a, a box for cash. You, you'll see it out there. And then there's another thing for a credit card. But you go on the website as well. Thank you. And thank you, Ryan, again, for managing all of this stuff. <laughs> thank, th thank you very much. And thank you all for coming. Have a good night.